I'm David Brown. I'm the uh, interim head of uh, Department of Curriculum and Instruction, and I'd like to welcome everyone to the fourth and final panel uh, in a series of panel discussions. So there's a, a great deal of complexity in uh, education and educational reform, and faculty and curriculum and instruction uh, look deeply into these complex issues in their scholarship. And we wanted to find a way to celebrate this scholarship and to bring awareness of the scholarship to a broad audience. And so this, um, this series of panels um, uh, will allow CNI faculty to articulate differing and sometimes competing perspectives on pressing issues of education in a format that will allow for a great deal of open and vigorous discussion. So unlike many talks where there are a few minutes at the end for questions, we wanted to have at least half of each session available uh, for open discussion of the issues. And distinguished moderators from outside uh, of the department will help to bring fresh perspectives uh, in the examination of these issues and will help to guide these open discussions. So we, we hope that you've enjoyed um, all of this uh, series of panel discussions. This is the final one. And we look forward to continuing to explore these uh, complex issues in future talks and classes, informal discussions, and, and other uh, venues. Um, but now I'd like to uh, turn to today's panel, the fourth one listed here, entitled, How Did Teachers and Teacher Education Lose the Profession and How Did We Get It Back? In our last panel, uh, which focused on issues of diversity and equity, one of the main topics in the open discussion was about preparing teachers to engage with our increasingly diverse student body. The professionalism needed for this engagement continues to be threatened uh, by policies, practices, and assumptions that treat teachers as technicians rather than as the consummate professionals that they are and that they need to be in their professional life. Today's panel will explore this issue and address questions such as what might teaching look like if rather than being told what to do, all teachers were adequately prepared with political knowledge to successfully navigate their work contexts. How can teacher educators resist increased corporatization of teacher preparation? How can professional development take into account teachers' knowledge about teaching their students and their schools in meaningful ways? I'll leave it up to the panelists to say more about these and other issues, but I wanted to say a little bit about each of the panelists before they speak. I'll say a little bit about our distinguished uh, moderator, Chris Higgins, uh, before the open discussion. <clears throat> Gloriana Gonzalez is an associate professor in math science and engineering education. She's been designing a professional development environment uh, and model that supports teacher agency through collaboration as part of an NSF funded grant. She'll contrast the model with traditional professional development programs and discuss how the model promotes teacher professional knowledge. Rosel Gutierrez is a professor in math science and engineering education. She's been a leading, uh, she's been leading an NSF grant where she has provided opportunities for teachers to develop the knowledge and stance to be effective advocates for their students. She'll talk about the work she's been doing to support teachers to use creative insubordination in their everyday practice. <laughs> Marilyn Johnson Parsons is a professor in curriculum aesthetics and teacher education. She and doctoral students teaching in the elementary program have been studying the ways in which a new teacher licensure test, the EdTPA, which I'm sure all of you know and love, has influenced the program. They found a narrowing of the curriculum and test preparation practices that they did not expect to find. Her project partners are Stephanie Cronenberg, Dory Harrison, Alexis Jones, Stacy Corson, Natasha Murray, and Michael Parrish. So at this time, I'd like to invite uh, Gloriana uh, to start us off. And after, each, um, after that, each of the others will brief briefly present their perspective. Each presenter will have about six to seven minutes, which should allow us a good amount of time for open discussion. So with that, I'll invite uh, Gloriana. Thank you. I see this as a dialogue that we're engaging, sharing a little bit of what we're doing in our research, in our work, and also listening from you and sharing some of our insights about things that we care the most in education. And I was thinking about my story as a professional developer and how I got started. And because a lot of the work I do is related to making stories of teaching, I wanted to share a little bit of my background and my story. So when I was a teacher, I had been teaching for a little while, and I was competent at teaching. I was hired to, I mean, I thought I was competent. But um, I uh, was hired to work as a professional developer 
uh, designing workshops for teachers. And I had math teachers coming on Saturdays, you know, on extra days for them to work. And for a series of Saturdays, we were investigating something about teaching with dynamic geometry, teaching with graphing calculators, something new about teaching. And looking back at those early experiences, there's some, you know, like in life, some things are good and some things that maybe you're thinking about them. I'm not sure uh, if we can, I, I think we can improve this. But some of the things that I think it was very positive was that the content was specific to a study, a course of study. So it was about geometry, about algebra, about teaching proofs. Also, it was something that it was a duration, the workshops were over a sustained period of time. So I got to know the teachers. It was not just a one-time event. They work on something for a period of time. And also, they incorporated some new strategies into their teaching. So they developed some sort of lesson plan where they were applying some of the things that we discussed in the workshop. But looking back at this, there were some things that maybe I want to reconsider. There were limited opportunities for collaboration. Uh, Teachers' classroom contacts only surfaced during lunch breaks, and that was very revealing for me because during lunch breaks is when they were saying that in their schools they didn't have enough materials, or they were had problems in the districts, or the difficulties with the students, things that were fundamental about their teaching, but only came across in their lunch breaks. And I didn't have, or we didn't have enough evidence about what happened in terms of the implementation. Sometimes we had some anecdotal evidence of people who tell us, I did this lesson, it was great, but we didn't know really what happened afterwards. And when we look at research and recommendations for research about teacher development, we know that teachers have specialized knowledge and that artifacts of teaching and learning can help to elicit that specialized knowledge. Also that teachers work best and learn best through collaboration, that the context in which teachers are teaching shape instruction, and also that professional development can help to make that knowledge of teaching public and help them to support each other in learning about te teaching. So those are the things that guide some of the work that we're doing in my um, grant supported by the National Science Foundation called Noticing and Using Students Prior Knowledge in Problem-Based Instruction. And what we're doing in this grant is to make a model that combines three strategies that have been effective for professional development. So one strategy is using, and this is fairly new, using cartoons, animated vignettes for teachers to talk about teaching. And that's great because they can talk about teaching with these fake scenarios that we make, and they're able to relate some of the things that they see in the scenarios with things that we uh, created. But also, we use them for them to start paying attention to student thinking in significant ways. So we create scenarios that promotes thinking about student thinking. We also are incorporated lesson study, which is a model of Japanese professional development where teachers get together, they plan a research lesson, they go and teach the lesson, they observe what happens about student thinking in the lesson, they come back and maybe revise that lesson in order to really pay attention better to student thinking and see how they can tailor instruction to maximize students' learning opportunities. And we're also integrating video clubs, which is an activity where teachers share videos from their own teaching, and they talk about student thinking. So some of the things that our teachers have said after participating in this program for a while is that they never, for example, have seen a continuous piece of evidence where students are working on a problem. And if you think about it, when students are uh, working on a problem and a teacher is teaching, you maybe go to this group and this other group and this other group. But having the opportunity to see student thinking for a while has been really revealing for the teachers, but also the opportunity to talk to other people about their teaching, people from other districts, and see that they have sometimes the same problems and how they address the problems of teaching has been very important. The opportunity also to sit down and think about lessons and think about specific concepts in geometry in this case, and how to pay attention to student thinking in relation to those concepts has been particularly important, but also sometimes the opportunity to share and talk to each other. So in answer to the question about how to support teachers to get their profession back, I'm thinking of three things. One is to empower teachers so they can draw upon their knowledge of students, of mathematics, curriculum, and the students' context in order to improve instructional opportunities. Teachers have a lot of knowledge, and we can promote opportunities to elicit that knowledge. Uh, 
Second of all is to help teachers to pay attention to student mathematical thinking and of how to motivate students to be engaged in mathematics. We know that many students were losing them because they don't think that mathematics is important and valuable, and this could be an important opportunity for teachers to get together and brainstorm our ideas about how to make mathematics meaningful for their students. And the third thing is to provide opportunities for teachers to collaborate with colleagues to build that professional knowledge. And that means that from working, from having ideas about the individual classrooms, they can share ideas together so that that knowledge is shared and they can make it public for other teachers in their profession to have ways of addressing their issues about teaching. Thank you. A couple of chairs back there. There's room here if we can bring some more chairs in. Buenas tardes. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, um, how we can help prepare teachers to better reclaim the profession through one thing that um, I'm referring to as creative insubordination. I wanted to acknowledge that this is a National Science Foundation grant, and some of the students who've been on the research team um, are here in the audience. Uh, Juan Manuel Gerardo is, is there. I don't see Gabriela. Um, for over 40 to almost 50 years, we've kind of had this model of the kinds of knowledge bases that teachers need. Uh, I go back to Shulman because even if we call it mathematical knowledge for teaching or we call it other, if we rename it in different ways, we still really only have these three different bodies. And although we've made a lot of uh, progress with respect to knowledge of students and in what ways that can inform culturally relevant teaching or, or ways that, that more honor different ways of bringing the community into school and, and acknowledging the things that students have, um, we haven't really dealt with the fact that there's all of this other stuff that's going on out there around um, how, how teachers are being told what it means to actually be a professional, in particular mathematics teachers where the stakes are pretty high for the standardized tests that they're being held accountable and that they're being judged by in terms of their own merit pay. So I make an argument that a fourth um, body of knowledge that we need to prepare teachers with is political knowledge. And that political knowledge is knowledge that's um, being able to deconstruct the kinds of messages that are being said about public education, about teachers, about particular kids and families. Um, but it also means being able to buffer yourself and work with others in ways that you can communicate what this thing is that you're doing and be able to stand up and advocate, in particular for um, historically marginalized and colonized communities. I can talk about some of the other things if people are interested later when we get asked questions. Um, but the, the community in El Mundo Surdo is just down there to recognize that this is all happening in a larger context of you doing this with other people. So this isn't like you develop this knowledge, you by yourself, and then you go out and somehow apply it when you get into a setting. So what do I mean by politics? Um, I, I, when I work with teachers, I tell them really any situation involving power dynamics. So any time that someone is using their status, their authority, or even just the language um, that, that's coming out of their mouths that exerts pressure on others to conform or to um, go along with something in, in particular in the status quo. Uh, so these are situations where other people tell us how to teach or run our classrooms and it's not in the best interest of our students. We recognize that corporate America, um, many of the people who are billionaires who have no expertise whatsoever in education are telling us how we should run our classrooms, are telling us how we should fund public education, are telling us um, what we should do. We have. Every day we have things that get packaged and sold, in particular to urban districts. So um, we get things like this notion of grit and growth mindset, um, all these things that get told to us that attending these, these things are really what's going to be in the best interest of kids. And we have to think about how do we help prepare teachers so that they can respond productively um, and can be advocates for their students. Because it's one thing to recognize that you um, that this is happening to our profession, but we don't want to just complain about it or feel kind of like, wow, it's you know lousy to be us. Um, we actually want to have some action that's driven as a result. So in the work that, um, that our project does, we support teachers to develop this political knowledge. And I, I kind of highlight just two pieces of it. One is this idea of deconstruction. So what are the stories that we tell about mathematics? For example, why do we tell these stories about ma mathematics being pure and about being more superior to other fields? And, and so in what ways do we as math teachers kind of perpetuate this idea of a, of a particular version of teaching that maybe we are complicit with or that we expect kids to go along with and don't necessarily question, or, or other people telling us that we need to be doing a particular form of mathematics and not recognizing, for example, that there are many mathematics that are practiced throughout the world, many that are devalued, ignored, or outright distorted, um, or maybe not recognizing that, um, uh, that 
kids don't necessarily have misconceptions, but rather that kids have conceptions and that those conceptions continue to work for them until they butt up against something that doesn't work. And so our notion of misconceptions when we ask teachers or when, when textbooks are telling teachers, prepare for students' misconceptions, anticipate misconceptions, we're already positioning students as they need to assimilate onto our way of thinking rather than how might that, mis that misconception or how might their conception um, help them frame things in a totally different way. We know that that's how things like non-Euclidean geometry came about. Um, I say I, helping them identify weapons of mass distraction. Uh, the mass distraction is that we get, we get these ideas that this is the thing you need to be doing as a teacher and this will address um, equity, for example. So whether it's the achievement gap or uh, growth mindset or these other things that don't really address any of the structural or historical things that have gone on racially in our society. Action is we act ourselves into new ways of thinking. Um, so it's the idea that we don't just talk about this stuff, we don't just intellectualize it, but we actually uh, we try to work towards uh, aligning our actions with our beliefs. So there's six strategies that we use for creative insubordination. These actually kind of came out of all of the work that the teachers that we've been doing for the last six years, um, kind of the work that they've been doing, and then it's just kind of, you know, we grouped them into these are six things. I just want to talk about one turn a rational issue into a moral one. And that's that um, this works when all the evidence and logic that you try to convince somebody of, of seeing your point of view doesn't work. Um, and this is the version of convincing people to do the right thing. So you might say something, let's say that, that something is brought up about um, in a department meeting or in a team meeting and other people don't agree with you and uh, you've shown them all kinds of data, you've shown them articles and blogs and research that says that this is in the best interest of our emergent bilinguals and we should be doing things this way, um, you might say instead, well, regardless of what the data say or what's been done in the past, is this really what we want to stand for or be remembered by as a department, that we went along with this change to a different textbook that's so text heavy and we're not giving them any additional support and so really our emergent bilinguals are being um, you know, uh, not helped, uh, even though that's what was sold to our district was this textbook. The inverse strategy of that is to use privilege instead of morals. Um, and that's that sometimes you have colleagues who doing the right thing doesn't appeal to them. So then you appeal to their ego. Uh, and you tell them, uh, well, that's what we're being told to do, use this textbook. But leaders aren't rule followers. Or, well, every, that's how everyone else thinks. But we're going to set a new trend. Uh, and I say, it's obviously, it's much better to use ethics than it is to use privilege. Um, when you're doing these things, but in the war on public education, I say really any strategy is worth considering. I just want to give you one example of a teacher who, she was in her second month of her first, her first, her second year of teaching, first month. She says, so we had a department meeting recently, and the director started talking about the achievement gap data, and we were looking at between Asian students, white students, African American students, Hispanic students. And he said something like, the other school in the district has fixed that issue and has been able to decrease the gap between African American students, but we've not fixed that yet. And a teacher said, well, do you know like, wait, why maybe that is? And he said, well, anecdotally, and this is just all I know from what I see, their peers don't encourage the kind of behavior that would be helpful to learning in the classroom. They kind of have this culture of grouping around, so they don't really, it seems like that helps them to disengage. So for this teacher sitting in the, in the meeting, she felt like he's basically saying the achievement gap is caused by black student culture. Is that really gonna sit out there at our department meeting? Or she says, I kind of looked around, there were 25 maybe more teachers in that classroom because we all had to be there, and no one said anything. And it was like passing on five seconds, like one, 1,000, two, 1,000, three, 1,000. And she said, really, no one's going to say anything to that? So I finally chimed in and I said, I know this isn't what you mean to say. It sounds like you're saying it's their fault, but obviously that's not what you're saying. So I just want to make sure that we're noting that there's a long history of oppression with respect to that group that's still happening today. And that's probably a lot of the reasons why we see what we see. And then, of course, he makes it seem like, yes, of course, that is exactly what I meant. <laughs> I just want to take, I, I have like 10 more seconds. Um, so the reason that she stood up in this case was not just because she thought by saying this to the principal, it was going to convince him of something different. But it's all, also that the people who are learning how to use this creative insubordination recognize that it, it means it's something larger than just that in the moment thing. It's also about something that happens long term. She says, OK, this is the boss that I've only taught one year. I don't know how I'm going to say what I want to say without sounding like I straight out disagree with you in a respectful way. I was just feeling a lot of fear. But I have to let myself be known to people. This is the kind of person I am. This is what I believe in. And if you wanted to talk about something that's important with respect to race, I'm the kind of person to talk to. So I'll just leave it there.
I can't wear this, so I'm going to put it someplace here. <laughs> Don't move. <laughs> Um, I'm going to talk about the use of the implementation of the NTPA, a performance assessment now required for teacher licensure in Illinois, to address our topic of whether teacher education has lost the profession. Nationwide, 677 teacher education programs in 38 states in the District of Columbia use the NTPA. The NTPA is a performance assessment developed by SCALE at Stanford. It parallels the National Board of Teacher, uh, no, 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 National Board of Professional Teaching Standards, which is available for practicing teachers. This is sort of a mini version of that. If we had to use an assessment for licensure, we were initially quite pleased that it was an assessment of performance. Pre-service teachers would have to demonstrate their ability to plan, teach, reflect, it mapped well onto our program goals. We thought we were ready to integrate test preparation into our program in a seamless and meaningful way. Some of you are giggling. But is the NTP a sign that we are losing the profession? On the one side, Darling Hammond and others have long argued that portfolio assessment provides a way to professionalize teaching education. Based on standards of professional practice, the NTPA assessment allows future teachers to demonstrate their ability to plan, teach, assess, and reflect. On the other side, Ken Zeichner and others argue that standardized accountability systems that are turned over to a corporate entity for scoring are likely to lead to increasingly prescriptive programs as teacher educators seek to meet the requirements of accountability. Further, there is the fear that this standardization may lead to a narrowing of curriculum and or de-skilling of teachers' ped pedagogical repertoire, as K-12 research has already demonstrated. Our research project Last year, we conducted a self-study narrative analysis of the pilot implementation of the NTPA. The scores were not consequential for licensure last year. Our narrative analysis documented an unintended trend toward teaching to the test. Our students were often more interested in how to do well on the test than their coursework, fieldwork, or field placements. As instructors, we ended up putting things aside that we thought were important in order to give more time for the students' assessment questions. Year two, this year, we're studying the students' reflections on their EdTPA experience by collecting focus group and interview, uh, interview data. <clears throat> so we want to see how it went. The context. Persistent critiques of education over the last 25 years have ushered in a testing culture at the K-12 level that may parallel what is happening in teacher education. Criticisms emanating largely from conservative think tanks have constructed the need for standardized assessments. There are lots of in examples. NCTQ that we know well of the Fordham Foundation ranks and rates teacher education programs based on published um, syllabi, you know, how accurate that must be. Uh, Arnie Duncan's blanket criticisms that teacher education is recalcitrant and of poor quality and that alternative preparation programs like Teach for America are the answer. Stephen Ball describes these criticisms as a well-planned strategic initiative to create the context for neoliberal interventions into education in the form of policies, programs, curriculum, and testing all requiring corporate interventions. From our research, we found these problems. We found in analyzing the portfolios that students who wrote well, even though they had a weak performance otherwise, could get a high score. The opposite was also evident. Strong performance in the program and the schools, but less well-written portfolios. In this sense, it's not really an assessment of teaching performance. It's a writing test. As a standard assessment, the EdTPA excludes students' wider participation in the teacher education program, including their ability to work collaboratively and get along with their peers, their ability to sustain positive relationships with students, their leadership skills, their social and cultural knowledge, and their social justice commitments. The professionals who work most closely with students in the program are sidelined from the decisions about whether or not they will be licensed to teach. Test scores speak loudly. 
More generally, many argue that the NTPA, like other high-stakes standardized assessment systems, fails to capture the complexity of teaching and learning, and in this sense, will always be partial and potentially inaccurate. The time required to write the assessment rubrics has meant that students have less time to plan for their real student teaching. The outside corporate scoring, which requires integrated reliability on scoring rubrics, means that students' responses must fit into tightly described rubrics, which for some narrows the complexity of what they wrote about. The EdTPA requires students to describe the context in which they teach because context is important to teaching. This assessment to the contrary removes the context of teacher education of the teacher education program from the assessment of their teaching, thus denying its relevance and importance, what Hutt calls context-less assessment. Thus our question is, has accountability become a normalizing discourse, legitimizing historic shifts from viewing education as a social and cultural to an economic project? In summary, it can be argued that we are losing control of the goal that teachers and students should learn together. Rather, we are learning to take a test. We are losing assessment as a tool for learning. Rather, we are instead assessing learning. A performance assessment with scoring turned over to a multinational corporation has diminished the significance of the judgments of teacher educators about who gets to teach. This neoliberal trend is a parallel trajectory to what has occurred in K-12 settings, where assessments drive curriculum and script teaching. The consequence has been a neat de-skilling and deprofessionalization of teaching. Will this also be the consequence for teacher education? If these are signs of losing the profession, how do we get it back? I want to thank the presenters for some powerful uh, presentations and, and raising some incredibly important issues. Um, and I wanted to move now to the open discussion. And before doing that, I want to introduce uh, Professor Chris Higgins, um, our distinguished moderator. He's an associate professor in the Department of Educational Policy, Organization, and Leadership, and has served as the director of the Illinois New Teacher Collaborative. Chris teaches undergraduate foundations and master's and doctoral level classes exploring the human dimensions of teaching and learning and the aims of education. He looks squarely at the teaching as a profession in his book, The Good Life of Teaching and Ethics of Professional Practice. Here he argues that the flourishing of the teacher is a necessary condition of education, critiques the latent asceticism in talk of teacherly service, and explores how the practice of teaching can become a vehicle for the teacher's own ongoing intellectual and existential growth. So I'd like to say thank you to uh, Professor Higgins for serving as moderator, and now I'll turn it over uh, to Chris to uh, lead the, the open discussion. And I uh, certainly invite all of you to be thinking of questions that you would like to bring up. We have about a half an hour for the discussion, so hopefully we'll have a, a rousing uh, discussion. Thanks, David. I think I'll stand up so I can see everybody. I really admire this series. I can't believe we get these presentations in in six minutes. It makes you wonder. What could an academic say in two minutes or just with one meaningful stare? <laughs> I mean, we're, we're really getting it down to a science here. Uh, OK, the floor is open. Questions, comments? Yes? Um, I really like what you just said about the rational versus the moral. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, since like, you're, you're in a co-worker setting and your co-workers have to like you, how do you, um, how do you like, A lot of it is about recognizing how do you how do you speak in ways that are not um, threatening? Um, how do you how do you learn how to raise I wonder questions? I wonder what it would look like. We're, we're adopting this textbook. I wonder what the I wonder what the you know Latino families in our community would say about this. I'm wondering if you know. So you don't say, I think this is really bad for our emergent bilinguals. You know, you, you raise the question. I wonder what other people would say about this. I wonder if we should get other people to come in and talk to us about how this might affect. I wonder, are any is anybody here thinking that 
this is going to affect, well, you, are there students you can imagine that are going to have problems with this textbook? And if so, what are they going to be? How, we, how might we address that? As a, so it, it becomes much less of a um, kind of in your face, like I'm better than you, um, and, and very much of a sense of empathy around um, a lot of times people come to the decisions that they make based on whatever information they've had. And so, for example, like you got raised in your family, you got a certain set of values and experiences and things that led you to think what you did. If you'd gotten raised in a different family, you might have gotten different things. And so not kind of making it seem like, you know, you're so dumb you don't see these things and I see these things, but rather like what kinds of, um, what kinds of opportunities could we have as colleagues to kind of share the different knowledge bases that we have. Oh, I don't know if I have any solutions. <laughs> um, I think teacher education for a very long time has used portfolio assessment and it's been done in-house by the people who know the students and work with them and can put a lot of context into that evaluation, including some of the things <clears throat> we're all talking about. Um, what's different about the EDPA is the standardization and the corporatization of it. And that changes the character of it. I mean, before it was, well, how can I do a good job with this? How can I write this up? How can I write a better reflection? And now it's, how do I write to this rubric in a particular way so that it will get scored a certain point? And they give you lots of information about how to do that. But it still becomes a very different kind of task. And that's what we find students reacting to. They don't want to know, they don't want to talk about issues in their classroom nearly as much. They want to know how to do something. This is a task they need to do. And I think that takes us in a very different direction. I actually would just also like to say something about that TP and ask you as well. We were facing this up to do right now as well. We are still not using it officially, but in math ed, we've been using it. This is, I think, our third year, and trying to kind of get to a space where we can use it in productive ways before you know the, right. the hammer comes down. But um, we actually, I mean, just speaking exactly to what you said, we even created a glossary of the language that they want you to use right. so that our students can start to use language that, and, and of course, it's language actually that is productive for our students to use as well. But in terms of kind of routinizing things, I mean, we definitely feel ourselves being pulled in that direction, yeah. kind of out of fear, right? It's again this fear of, um, you know, fear of what, what's going to happen when actually this mm -hmm. begins to be assessed outside. That's right. We've done a couple things this year that are different. Lynn Burdick is our NTPA queen, and she <laughs> consistently answers questions for students even at 2 o'clock in the morning. And that has simplified the information that students get, and Lynn is just fabulous at doing that. So that's. <laughs> I don't. I don't know how she does that. You know, and and we're all trying to pay attention to not teaching to the test, but it's very difficult. Uh, they have specific questions. They want to know how to do this, and I want them to think about um, what they're doing, not just write to the rubric. So. Just, just say no to email in the middle of the night. No more. No more. <laughs> no, Can these I, are phone calls. <laughs> yeah, okay. It's even worse. Can I ask the three of you a question? Um, would you all agree that what we're looking at is both a very old problem and a new version of it that may be particularly virulent and have a certain form? So I'm thinking of, like I just taught that um, Berliner piece, uh, ed Educational Reform in an Era of Disinformation. He gives these quotes from turn of the century, teacher bashing to say like it's our national pastime. Teacher bashing goes all the way back. Or Willard Waller, Sociology of Teaching, 1932, says nobody tries to control a practice more than people try to control teaching. And parents want to control it, administrators want to control it, policymakers want to control it, teachers are even being pushed around by their students. Uh, he's looking at this problem back in, in 32. So we have this whole history of a struggle for autonomy. Lots of sources of heteronomy and teacher bashing. And I think that's true. And we have these new, very troubling forms. I wonder if that sounds right and what would you say is new about the new forms of this problem? 
I would say one of the new forms is how it's linked to capitalism. I mean, that's very clear that we haven't had this long history of how this is how corporate America has benefited from. I mean, we've always had the critique. Teaching's always been a political act, but I think that, that the current forms that we're seeing now, where um, where things are being uh, monopolized by particular groups and where philanthropists are now coming in and have whole marketing campaigns around trying to make something seem um, uh, good for the public, like charter schools. Um, I think that's at a whole nother level now. Where it, and it's also becoming commonplace for people to say, you know, I'm Eli Broad, I'm going to invest $490 million so that I can um, I can privatize all of the Los Angeles public schools, and that's going to be the model for the entire country. <coughs> have that kind of branding and, and profit that's connected to it, I think feels different. I think I like Stephen Ball's book, Education Inc. Uh, he lays out with a lot of research the systematicity of what's going on now, which I think we haven't had in the past. We had textbooks, you know, there were lots of corporate kinds of uh, things going on, but he, he lays out how Neil neoliberal policies have been supported and systematically taken to legislators to put this into policy by conservative think tanks and how that's become global not just here um, and i think that systematicity and corporatization is really is, is new it's more widespread it's deeper well, when you think about a lot of professional development initiatives uh, some of these our teachers said was with a um, when we have a professional development in our building, they say, oh, it applies to everything but for math. You'll have to figure it out. Or they may say something like, you're the expert in doing rubrics. Why don't you teach everybody? So there's a lot of funding, and there's a lot, there are a lot of professional development initiatives, but sometimes they don't apply to exactly what teachers are doing or they underestimate teachers' expertise. And that's what I was trying to say at the beginning, that in my journey, I had wonderful lessons with dynamic geometry, and I shared with the world and with the other teachers. But the context in which they were teaching maybe was very different from my own context, and maybe they couldn't do the same thing. Uh, and now what we're trying to do is to support teachers so that they can move along using their expertise and helping out each other. Sometimes at a different pace than what we want. Sometimes at a even faster pace or slower pace. But taking their expertise and making it viable so that the changes that they do really can happen in their own classroom at their own pace and using each other. Yeah, Kathleen. Um, I appreciated all the talks. Thank you. I'm wondering um, what your thought is of any of your thoughts are about unions and their role in um, helping the profession establish uh, its professional self again. And um, I mean, you sort of been profiling the role that the university has really with research, which is of course something I believe in. But um, I'm wondering what you think the role, the unique role of the union is or realistically could be going forward. And I, I think there's another room and there's people in there. They've asked if you can repeat the questions into the microphone so they can hear <coughs> okay. what's going on. The question was, <laughs> <laughs> what is the role of unions in pushing it back, back against these processes of deprofessionalization and de-skilling? Who wants to take that first? <laughs> well, I mean, I think the first thing is being able to deconstruct what's going on, right? So we know that with charter schools, um, they're pretty much non-union, right? So right there, you're getting rid of um, and, and, and the push against any kind of collective bargaining in general is happening to the profession. But I think informing, like one of the things I do is I help inform the teachers that I'm working with that like, do you realize when you go to a charter public school, this, you're part of this bigger thing that's happening and you need to be making wise choices about do you want to be, um, do you want to be in a place that doesn't have a union? So part of it is kind of educating our teachers to make informed decisions rather than kind of not understanding everything that's out there because kind of how could they achieve it. Uh, I think the other is, you know, helping, uh, helping our teachers recognize that that is an important space and that you can go to your union when you have issues and that this is something you should be using and that you should be involved with. Um, uh, the teachers that come to you with problems, automatically I tell them, go to your union rep or you know, who you, you know, do things with your union. So part of it, I think, is kind of 
um, making those practices seem normal, like you, you should have a union and a, sh and a union has these things and should have your back and you should know who your person is and you should go to meetings and you should, part of that is what does it mean to be a professional? But I'm not sure I have anything bigger to say about how we can protect more than what we have in our unions. I sort of feel like Bernie against the world talking about all this because there are lots of arguments in the space and Lots of people doing things and unions are certainly pushing. There's a huge critique in the literature coming out against NTPA now, but it doesn't go very far. There's just a lot of money and a lot of history and a lot of legislation. There was a huge pushback in Illinois against putting the NTPA as a, a consequential test. It went nowhere. Uh, and people who are money and backing from particular sources seem to win all the time. And I feel really discouraged about it, but as, uh, as always, wanted to be a political activist. So we're starting a petition. Here. Anybody who's interested in doing an opt-out movement on NTPA, <laughs> we're, we're going to launch it here and be known at the University of Illinois as not being rule followers. We are going to be the people who <laughs> did So this. just as a counter, I will tell you the story about Barbara Magdaloni. Okay. She was at Amherst early on. She got her students to protest and not take the NTPA, and she got fired uh, after a story in the New York Times described what her students were doing. You know, so we don't like those stories. And when I suggested early on that we just not do it in Illinois, I saw faces just go white in my faculty. Because you know what that means. That's hard to do. And there are usually consequences for that. And are we willing to do that? It doesn't seem to me like we are. Okay, three. One, two, three. So to piggyback off of that and talking about unions and talking about how we can continue to professionalize teaching, can we talk about or can you talk about ideas that can happen at the university level for, say, the College of Education to model such professionalism and supporting the increase of professionalism in the profession? Because for example, the GEO was not, like when asked to come in to talk to grad students, was told they couldn't come into the college to talk to grad students. And so things like that seem to kind of counter, like we're having this discussion, but then we're also not role modeling maybe. And so I'm wondering if there's little things that can happen on that level. So the question for the mic was, how do we role model uh, can you give me a one sentence summary? Sure. How can the university role model raising the professionalism of teaching? Okay, the question is how can the university role model raising the professional status of teaching? Sure. Gloriana, do you want to start? Well, I'm thinking that a lot of our research is not consumed by teachers. Sorry, is GEO a student union? Student mm -hmm. okay. Student. Student. Maybe I'm going a different angle, but I think a lot of us who do research about student thinking or about teaching, we don't do we don't get that research out to the teachers who are the ones who benefit the most. We think that we are doing something for other journals or getting publication, but we don't do the extra step of translating that. I'll give you an example. When we started working on the project, we wanted to make examples of problem-based lessons around two conceptual domains. In geometry, what is a perpendicular bisector? What is that age? And we use as an excuse that those two concepts were in the Common Core Standards. When we as researchers went to look for research about student knowledge in those conceptual domains, we didn't find enough. Or we didn't find enough that could be usable for teachers. And what we did was that we conducted a parallel study where we identified how do, how do students make sense of these concepts, and then we embedded that into the work that we did. But maybe in science education it's different, that they have conceptual domains that you know everything about how students think about light or how students think about motion. Maybe it is. But sometimes some of the things that we have in math education are not consumed by teachers in a way that they can use it in their classroom. And we were able to build that, but it's sometimes we don't, I think, I think that sometimes as researchers, we don't make the connection between student learning and what happens in the classroom and provide the tools for teachers to make sense of what's happening in the classroom. Maybe one way to rephrase the question a little bit is, our job as teacher educators to help people fit into a system 
or to promote um, insubordination of some sort. So somewhere in the spectrum between that. So I don't know, Rochelle, do you want to? I mean, on, on the ground, like yeah. what can the, not not research, but like what can the college do? I, I no, I, I want to do the same. I want my students to know what's going on. I mean, I want them to be aware of who Pearson is and why this test is being scored by Pearson, how that's different than how in the past, how that relates to the testing in the schools. I mean, they need to know about that. That's deconstructing or making them subversive. I mean, I really think that's important, and I hope I'm modeling a thoughtful, critical stance as an educator. One way we've done that within the secondary mathematics group is that we've <clears throat> created um, um, professional issue like modules. Like these are things that you need to understand. You need to understand Common Core, and you need and for the, everything you need to understand about Common Core, you need to understand the critique. And everything you need to understand about, about you know teacher evaluations, Danielson framework, all that, you need to know the critique. And for everything that you need to understand about you know whatever about TPA or so whatever the issue is. You need to understand the critique. And we tell them that this is important for you to understand um, so that you aren't just a consumer as a teacher and can, you can be a leader. We don't necessarily say so you can be a creative and subordinator because not everybody loves that language. But we say if you want to be a leader in your school, um, you have to be cognizant of it. And I really liked what you said about the history is that there's going to be a group of people starting this year who had no idea that there was anything other than the EdTPA. So we have to help them see that, like, this, was, this is not like the only truth that we could be participating in. Like only two years ago, we were using portfolios. And they need to understand what that means. They need to understand that you're now paying $300 to a, corporate, to a corporatization or to a corporation that you didn't have to pay to. And you are also become a data collector for them by you having to indicate on your paperwork that you turn into them what textbooks are being used in the school you're working in, what edition is it, all of that kind of stuff. You're paying them $300 to do work for them to know who are their clients. And they need to understand that because otherwise I think it's difficult to feel like should they stand up. Um, the other thing I think we've, we've done is incorporate the use of teacher blogs. So not telling them what to go look at, but just telling them go find three blogs to follow this semester. They're going to find teachers out there talking about what's going on in the trenches. And it doesn't necessarily have to then just come from us. That like It sounds like you're the crazy political activist that I have to listen to. It's like, oh my god, there's teachers out there talking about how they're getting their rights stripped, or they're, you know, the district's telling them this, or parents are telling them this. And, and then they're trying to strategize with other teachers how to learn about this. So, they, so helping them recognize that's what it means to be a professional to be able to understand what's come before you and how you fit in, but also recognizing that you should be part of a network of teachers who can push back on this thing. Since we're a little short on time, I think maybe I'll take three in a row and then have you respond to all of them as a group, that's okay. So it's one, two, three. Uh, so I'm a freshman I'm in your class, um, and um, <laughs> and so I am that student that you're talking about who didn't know anything other than a TPA. I actually didn't even know of a TPA until you mentioned it. Um, and so I knew there were a lot of these problems going on, which is why I came to this panel. And I'm trying to wrap my head around it and like the core of the problem and that sort of thing. And kind of what I'm hearing and what I'm coming to understand is this cycle of um, these corporations and the capitalism coming in and profiting off of us um, and us trying to serve, having to try and serve them and the reason that they're doing that is because we're defunded and so we need funding so we have to, you know, meet those standards to try and get that money and it's like, um, I don't know if that, what I just said made any sense but it just sounds like kind of this cycle um, and um, I'm feeling that anxiety, and I'm sure a lot of students and a lot of people in teacher education are feeling that too, almost this anxiety of like, how do I get ahead of that? Like, how do, how do I move ahead of that? Like, how much earlier can we go? Um, because you're trying to instill these ideas um, in students that are going into education, um, but it still feels almost like helpless. Like, well, I just came in here, and things seem to be a little bit like, um, Things seem to be changing a lot, and um, but I'm all, like my face is also not yet turned white, um, and I'm wondering uh, what I have to be scared of, maybe. So how do you this for the mic? It's hard to summarize that. that yeah. Was, how do you balance um, wanting to be aware of all the problems with not being overwhelmed when you're trying to just 
make your way into a brand new profession. It's one way to sum it up, that's yeah. okay. <laughs> No, I'm going to take three in a row. Yes? Uh, I guess mine was just sort of maybe expanding the, if, you know, the creative insubordination with, like, research, uh, with mathematics teachers to the different levels, especially with the concerns about what are different approaches we can do this to the anti-FTPA, the corporatization, privatization, anti-union. So meaning for us future academics to sort of see more senior, you know, faculty, what, what their particular responses and maybe, you know, those building their, uh, their careers and what their responses, because, you know, as grad students are paying attention to all this and we have a particular stance on this, you know, we want to be able to have options to go, oh, all right, not doing it alone, who's also doing it, and in different ways you can respond, you know, respond to like the particular impact on our current schools and education, so. So how do we make sure we're talking to each other so that we learn different ways of responding and also so we don't feel like we're alone with it? I just want to make sure, remember, Marilyn, it's my job to be the cheerleader. Absolutely. Right? Okay. So um, I want to make sure everyone understands that while Pearson does, in fact, um, uh, hire the scorers for NTPA, the scores for NTPA are educators. So while in fact they are collecting $300, it has totally become, it is a corporate thing, there's no question. I do want the white faces not to happen and know that the people who are, that you still have to deal with inter rater reliability, you still have to score specifically to a rubric, but I want to make sure everyone understands that there is some knowledge base other than reading requirements for the people who are issuing the scores, issuing the scores to the kids. Okay, point of information, Pearson hires educators to rate the exams. They are making a ton of money, however. Okay. <laughs> I know what they're paying the scorers, and I know what our kids are paying. <laughs> kids pay 300, the scorers get 75 for three hours work. So, okay. you can get more tutoring calculus. <laughs> And they get whatever textbook is being used in your local district, so they know where they need to go market better if they're not using Pearson products. Other responses to how to handle the overwhelming feeling as you're, as you're trying to come into a new profession and you have to come into it open-mindedly but also critically right from the start, um, or responses to how do we uh, form networks so that we're not doing this alone. And well, we one thing in the secondary math program, we decided that we're not we're not preparing teachers for the TPA. We have bigger goals than that. And I, if we com I compare that when I taught AP calculus, I was teaching calculus. I was not teaching for the AP test. Now I wanted them to do well on the test. I did. And I taught them the test, and I, we, we did some examples. And the way it relieved me when I was teaching calculus, I was like, they're going to take your point off. It's not me. I'll give you the point, but the scores are going to take your point off. So it relieved some of my uh, language that you need to know this, not because you need to make your answer clear. Not because of me, I know you. You're a very coherent person, but your score is not going to know you. So in a way, you can tell that some of these things can help us to pay attention to maybe some things that maybe got, um, I don't know, maybe we're not that important. All of us want to have our teachers to pay more attention to student thinking. All of them was want us to do some teaching that develops conceptual understanding. Now, we cannot just limit our goals in the program to the NTPA, and that's a decision that we made together, and we said we can't. And there's some other activities, and there's some other goals and events that we're doing that are beyond the FTPA. And we, cl we clearly believe that those are very important. When we have the a capstone activity, which is engaging the community in a math event, it's not really something that scores anything in the FTPA. But, right, it's been, we've been trying to get that activity, even when there are changes in format, less coursework and everything we believe it's very important. Anything else for you? Yeah. Um, so it's Annabelle, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so Annabelle is one of about 120 students that's in an undergraduate course that's a foundations class that got launched this year in the College of Education. So it's very exciting that there's a group of people who most are freshmen, um, some are going to be educator, educators, some are not, <coughs> that they're starting to grapple with these ideas. So we used to not get people until they were, at least in secondary, we used to not get people until they were juniors or seniors. So it's exciting for me that people are starting to have these conversations, even if it feels overwhelming at this time, know that we have them for a few years to start developing 
you know, a stance, their ideas, where they, what do they feel about all this. But it's also directing people to the resources. So when, I, when I'm working closely with my preschool teachers, I'm saying, uh, these are the places that you go to to help you. So there's New York Core, there's Creating Balance in an Unjust World, there's you know Rethinking Schools, there's what, and I, I say, here's people who are organizing, here's the blogs, here's the whatever, go read Diane Ravitch's stuff, or go read this, whatever. If you want that perspective, now maybe that's not the perspective that you want, but if you feel like, I'm excited. I'm excited about these ideas. I don't want to just go along with the system, but I don't really know what to do. Then I say, then go find other people who are doing that and learn from them. Don't try to reinvent the wheel yourself, and definitely don't try to do this work all by yourself. So again, I think a big piece of it is first figuring out what is this thing you stand for. And I say it's the mirror test. I say don't you know you don't have to stand for what I stand for, but you need to know what you stand for, and then you need to stand for that. So then it's just finding the allies of who are the people that are already doing this stuff, teachers that are in the trenches doing this work. And I and I don't mean to say that as like and that puts all the weight and burden on teachers' shoulders because I think we should also as colleges of education and as professional societies and. We need to be recognizing that there is this political work that's happening for teachers, and we need to support people to be able to do it, and we need to be writing op-ed pieces and doing other things that are in the public sphere that speak back to, to media and policymakers. Other question? Yes. Yeah, I do. With regard to uh, Marilyn's comment that um, with that TPA may be assessment of becoming an assessment of work. <laughs> rather than of teaching. So I find that really interesting as a literacy person, a scholar. I wonder if you think um, certain kinds of writing are being privileged. And maybe if, that, if so, does that intersect with the idea that we want to have students from marginalized backgrounds as teachers in this country? I think it's very much privileged as a certain kind of writing about a certain kind of thing. And that advantages students over others. I think there's no doubt about that. <laughs> there's actually been studies that have been conducted that have shown that students who um, are emergent bilinguals either are more discouraged to take the test and even want to go into teacher education in the first place and or don't score well the first time that they take it and that much of this is, is likely due to um, what kinds of languages are sanctioned. And I'm wondering as a linguist, I mean, there's some linguist, uh, if there's some work you know, that has been done, for example, in political science, trying to figure out that um, students who are taking a political science course do better just because of the genre and knowing better how to write, if a similar study can be done to figure out if the writing is better, it leads to better scoring. Um, that would be an interesting study. I, I know in Texas, it was interesting to see the number of people that failed that state's teacher preparation test, and people were paying sometimes 120 bucks a whack and taking yes. the test 10 times. Yes. And you also have times. So I'd be curious to find out what's happening with EDPA, people are repeating and, and deciding to stop out after a while for economic reasons. So it's a good income <laughs> test. The test's income pretty yes. well. Because <laughs> there's a proliferation now of companies that, like, you send them your video, they will package an EDPA uh, portfolio for you to send off to Pearson. So just like there's companies out there that while you're in college, they'll write essays for you. You tell them, here's my topic, they'll, you give them three, whatever, how many dollars, they'll get you back an essay. There's places now who will write your head TPA for you. Yeah, there's all kinds of outsourcing. There's a really nice article in TCR about all these... Teachers' college record. Teachers' college record, sorry. Um, about how this is proliferating uh, a whole set of companies programs that will help you pass the NTPA. Is that a recent issue? Um, within the last two years, yeah. I can give you the reference. I think it's about that time. I think so. And um, so please join me in thanking our uh, panel.